Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, since Chile is really far away from Kosovo, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to here to, to speak and eventually speak a lot. Uh, so the people that are standing there, uh, it will be a torture if they stay for an hour standing. So I would recommend to not to be shy and come in front and sit on the floor uh, if necessary. I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, if you want, during the conversation and get tired and want to come and sit, no problem, do that. So. Um, the title or the, the, the idea that I wanted, the umbrella under which I want to present actually three projects, which is an extended version of a TED talk I gave uh, some time ago, last year, is that if there's any power in architecture, that's the power of synthesis. I guess that, that I wasn't told when I studied architecture, that that was the power of architecture. I was trained in form making, in composing, in designing, as designing understood as a kind of aesthetic operation. It is that. But if there's any power in form making, it that it is that it's able to capture a lot of forces of different nature, political nature, social nature, economical nature, environmental, and synthesize it into form. What I'm going to show here are projects where the starting point is not architectural. The problems that we're dealing with are not problems that interest other architects, are problems that interest the society at large. We ourselves enter these projects as citizens. We're worried about poverty, security, uh, inequalities, and as a citizen, eventually you vote to correct that, but as an architect you may contribute with the power of synthesis of design to come up with some proposals. So the question that we normally ask ourselves in the office is what informs the form of a project? Information comes from many different fields, but in the end becomes a form. We're in these things as form makers as designers. But what informs that form comes from outside architecture. And I would like to show a couple of examples of how this has been developed at Elemental in the last years. So, just to start with, um, one second. Okay, so just to start, the menu of, of today will be the need of synthesis in at least three different fields. Social housing, the reconstruction after a disaster, in this case an earthquake and a tsunami in Chile, and uh, in building design, a more conventional practice, let's say. The need for synthesis in social housing actually is, is not really a choice. There's no other way to do social housing unless you synthesize, because there's no money. The need for synthesis in the reconstruction af after a catastrophe is because there's no time. And the need for synthesis in a, in a more conventional building, let's say, is because there's too much money and too much time. So you need the discipline of synthesis, otherwise you get lost. The operations that you tend to do with a lot of resources tend to be arbitrary. So synthesis is a way to overcome superfluous and necessary operations. So before going into this, just to give you a quick glance of the kind of things that we've been doing lately in the office, I'm not going to explain this project necessarily, but just to you have an idea of the kind of things that we're doing in building design, uh, we were finalists in Moscow for the um, Museum of the National Arts. 
contemporary arts. We didn't win the competition, but uh, this is in the category of, let's say, more conventional buildings. On the other extreme, a house, a private house, we do very little houses, actually we built only one. Uh, but there's another end, a more conventional practice of architecture. Architects do houses. In both cases, we're looking for a certain primitiveness, let's say. A museum, we were shortlisted in Santiago too. A project that we're finishing in China, uh, and we're not allowed to show it, but just to, to, to let you know that kind of, uh, this is one of the few projects we have abroad, in the southern part of Chile, uh, for a forest company. A project that is being built in Switzerland for uh, writer's cabins. A school for low-income neighborhoods in Chile as well. A competition in Paris, we went to the second phase, now into the third one. Uh, it's a competition in Paris. A project for a metropolitan promenade in Santiago, a 10 kilometer uh, pedestrian road at the heel of the metropolitan park. So public space in this case. A project for a mining company that involves not even four cities but an entire region. And uh, this model, I, you will understand when I explain the reconstruction of the earthquake, uh, that in the end translates into a set of several buildings. Uh, but in this case, as I said, they cover a region. So, this, this is more or less the, the kind of muscles that we are training meaning by muscles, designing different scales, different programs, and those design skills are brought to public projects, social housing, uh, projects of a certain political scale. But from the public world, what we take is that given the scarce resources, we smuggle into the more conventional practice of architecture a certain discipline, a certain attachment to very few means, which is a very healthy uh, thing. So, as I said, the need for synthesis in social housing where there's no money or in catastrophes reconstruction where there's no time um, has a threat. If there's no time and no money, there is a potential lack of quality. Uh, so, in a way, the scarcity of means requires an abundance of meanings. If I'm going to be able and allowed to do just one thing or two things, better make sure that those one or two things are relevant. The threat on the other end of the spectrum, if you get too many resources and too much time, is that you can get lost. So sometimes, and this is the way we look at what is going on in the first world, in developed countries, that having too many resources means that this abundance of meanings ends up being a scarcity, a scar an abundance of means ends up uh, ending being a scarcity of meaning. Projects that have no meaning, that are meaningless somehow. So this is what we have been trying to be careful, not the, a mistake not to commit while working. So going to the first case, social housing. And let me give you a little bit of context. You as architects or architecture students might already know this. But we're living in an urban age. You, we will actually, we already crossed in 2007 the threshold of having more people living in cities than on the countryside. Several reports, several uh, events dedicated to this phenomenon of a world becoming urban. This is in principle good news. The more people live in cities, the better. Even if counterintuitive, People concentrated in urban settlements are better served if you want public policies to improve health, sanitation, access to education, access to jobs, transportation. It's much more efficient if you have people concentrated to improve quality of life in the cities than on the countryside. Cities are also very powerful vehicles to create wealth. 
The concentration of ideas, human capital, knowledge, even money, is what more and more is driving the economies of countries. So, in principle, more cities and more people coming to cities is good news. There's a problem, though, because cities seen from that point of view are like magnets that attract a lot of good things, but they are also a kind of ticking time bomb. The pressure that accumulates in cities may explode, explode in a way that we don't want it to be, and mainly through these three reasons, which I call the three S. The process of urbanization is going to happen, and it's happening at a scale and speed and with a scarcity of means with no precedence in human history. So for you to have an idea, out of the three billion people living in cities today, one billion is under the line of poverty. By 2030, we will have five billion people living in cities and two billion are going to be under the line of poverty. In order to accommodate the migration of people towards cities, we will have to build a one million people city per week with $10,000 per family. So this is the equation that we, as a mankind, have to solve. One million people city per week with $10,000 per household. If we don't solve this equation, it is not that people will stop coming to cities. They will come anyhow, but they will live in informal settlements, slums, favelas, with all the problems that I mentioned before, the ticking time bomb that we merely accumulate as social and political pressure over the system. So knowing that it's important, it is relevant to find a solution for how to solve this equation, social housing in countries like ours, where you have a scarcity of means, may provide a clue to give some knowledge for how to deal with this equation. And in this sense, the Elemental project may be uh, at least an alternative. I'm really not, not going to bore you with the details. This is an economical language and policy language. If you're interested, we may comment it, not in this, in this context, but it, extreme, it is extremely important to understand and speak this language, even though our contribution is ultimately design. But to explain it in simple terms, I would describe the social housing problem as, as this. Evidence shows that wherever in the world you, you are, be it London, Chile, Africa, or Asia, a middle-class family can live reasonably well in around 80 square meters. If there's money to do that, there's no problem. That money can be at the private level, or can be at the public level. If you take a look at what Scandinavian countries do, social housing is more or less at this, in following these numbers. And uh, private households in, in less uh, lower income countries do more or less go around that figure. <coughs> but what happens if there's no money? Well, what the market tends to do is to reduce the size of the house and the evidence shows that in average in the world, developing countries are able, in the best, best of the cases, deliver solutions of around 40 square meters. What markets does, or what government does, when they do not have money, is two things. Well, first one, reduce the size of the house. So lack of money is, in principle, a reduction. Reduce. The other thing, and I don't know how, how is it here in Kosovo, but in Latin America, it's a tragedy, is to displace. Put the social housing where land costs nothing. In countries like ours, in cities like Santiago, this means two hours away from where there's the jobs, the schools, health facilities. Uh, so the reason why people come to cities, which is to have access to opportunities, is absolutely missed because you place the housing of the poor, where there's no opportunities, where land costs nothing. So what the market does when there's no money, reduce and displace. If we just focus on the size side of this 40 square meter small unit, we thought that this made no sense. And what we did was to ask ourselves, what if, instead of thinking 
the 40 square meters, which is what we can pay with public money, instead of looking at it as a small house, we look at those 40 square meters as half of a good house. So, half of a good house instead of a small one. This, in other terms, is saying incremental housing. If there's no money, instead of reducing, concentrate now in what is more crucial and allow them over time to achieve that middle uh, class standard. This is not new. This exists in the world since the 70s. Many examples are there's no newness in this kind of thing. What is new is to look at the problem as half of a good house instead of a small one. There's many, many media that have reported about this thing, oh, these guys that are doing half of a house. To be precise, we're doing half of a good house. And this is where the, the difference uh, is, in the half of a good house. Because when you rephrase the problem as half of a good house instead of a small one, the key question is, which half do we do? And we thought that with public money, we had to do the half that a family cannot do individually. This is the, defi this is the definition of a public policy. You take care of what cannot be done at the individual level. So we identified a set of five design conditions that belong to the half that families cannot do individually. That was one point. Second point, a house should be opposite of a car. In countries, in developing countries like ours, Africa, Latin America, housing policy tend to be property oriented, meaning when a poor family receives a subsidy, they become the owner of a house. So a house is the biggest trespass of public money into a family private asset. And one would like that trespass of money, of public to the private, not to perform like a car, that every day, is, every day that goes by, the value goes down, but as a house. All of us, when buying a house, expect its value to grow every single day. Even if we don't do nothing, almost naturally, properties, real estate, grow its value over time. Social housing tends to be like a car and not like a house. For different reasons, the value of those properties goes down instead of going up. So we identify five design conditions that allow the value of such a property to go up instead of going down. The importance of this is that we, if we're able to create this value for a property, housing could be seen as an investment and not just as a social expense. In that way, what we're doing ultimately is to use the housing policy as a tool to fight poverty and not just as a shelter against the environment. So, with those, these two points, half of a good house instead of a small one, and houses able to grow its value over time, we were asked in 2003, this initiative started in 2001 at Harvard University, in 2003 to solve the following equation. Can you provide a solution for a hundred families that have been occupying illegally a half an hectare site, 5,000 square meters, for the last 30 years in the center of a city in the northern part of Chile, using a subsidy of $7,500, which in the best of the cases can provide for around 30 square meters for a family? Can you do that? That was the question. And for you to have an idea, with $7,000, we had to buy the land, provide the infrastructure, and build the houses. And normally this was distributed in, in three-thirds. So in the end, what we had was around $2,500 to actually build the house. And as I said, this is a property-oriented uh, policy. So these were the rules of the game. How to solve the equation? Well, we had no idea. We just knew that whatever will come out would be something in between a building and a house. As a building, it will be able to make an efficient use of the land 
so that we can pay for this well-located piece of land in the center of the city. And as a house, it had to be able to grow. The conditions of the existing, this piece of, of, of favela, of slum here, were extremely bad. No ventilation, no, no sewage, uh, problems of drug dealing. So it, it was a kind of dangerous environment. But despite these very bad living conditions, the city around here was highly desirable to be maintained within the social network of these families. And actually, the amount of services that were around this plot, jobs, education, health, recreation, expressed in the value of the land, three times more than what social housing normally could pay. And that's why families were normally expelled to the periphery. So, knowing that, we started the process of participatory design with the families because the scarcity of means had a high chance not to fulfill families' expectations. So this is exactly the same PowerPoint we showed to the families, just not in English, but the exercise was like this. Okay, if you're expecting detached units, isolated houses in the middle of a lot, well, we can accommodate 30 units following the policy. If you come to an agreement, who the 70 families that have to leave the site uh, and negotiate that, fine, your problem. There will be one issue left though. If we put the subsidies of the 32 families that are left, we were not even able to pay for the land in the center. But then we said, well, imagine we go to a, a millionaire and ask for a philanthropist act and, and get the land for free uh, as a donation. Well, detached units have no capacity to control the growth. Actually, somewhere here you see the roofs of these kind of things that are swallowed and eaten by self-construction. So what you end up having is a very bad neighborhood as the original one with no value because of the de de deterioration of the space. So this was not an alternative. Alternative number two, all of these existing uh, typologies in the market, row houses, where the width of the lot has been reduced to make it coincident with the width of the house, furthermore, with the width of the room. Three meter wide houses. Hundreds of thousands of units have been built following this model. We did slightly better, 60 houses instead of 32. But the problem with this the typology is that whenever you wanted to grow, and we were in a policy that required to double the initial size of the house, you either block bathrooms and kitchens, or you have, you have to circulate through the room to go to the expansions. So what you get, instead of efficiency of land, is overcrowding. This, as a consequence, was not an alternative either. Third alternative existing in the market. Let's go up, build in height. This is known as, as the building block. We could accommodate, in this case, the 100 units, the 100 families. But families threatened us to go to a hunger strike or hunger greve, if we even dare to offer this as a solution, because they couldn't expand the unit. Actually, take a look, the pressure for growth in here is so big that this guy takes out that wall, expands over here, this guy here expands over here because of the earthquakes we have in Chile. Whenever there is a lateral movement, this building collapses. So this is a major threat for life, not even for uh, the value of the property that we had to avoid. So this was not an alternative either. So the conclusion of the participatory design process was that we were in trouble. And this is an extremely important conclusion because if together with the families you don't understand that the existing knowledge is not enough, then it makes no sense to try to find out different alternatives. So what we did was reframe the problem 
and try to look for the best possible $750,000 building and as conditions. As I showed before, the problem with buildings is that they do not allow for expansion. And that's true except on the ground floor and in the upper floor, because the ground floor can expand horizontally, as we saw, and the upper floor can expand vertically into the air. So what we did was a building that only had the ground and the upper floor. And we displaced those tiny units so that to cover at least 50% of the urban front, so that then the expansions could fill in the gaps and the void and still guarantee some quality of the urban uh, layout. We started a series of workshops with the families when, where we had the, the household head, normally a woman, uh, to come and discuss and we wanted to make sure if we were on the same page, if we were understanding the same thing. So we asked them to draw and write how they were they getting the proposals, the housing proposals that we were uh, coming up with, or how they are going to intervene the facades, how the growth was going to happen. You know, always in the last place one would like it to happen or the courtyards. And in any case, this is how the families visualized and anticipated that the project was going to look like. For $7,500, what could be done, so what the rest of the market was doing, were this 36 square meter boxes, 45 minutes away, in the outskirts of the city, actually already in the kind of the different uh, city, where land costs nothing. And we had to prove that for the same amount of money, paying for a land that costs three times more, we could build this. So, as you see, the notion of design is no, is no kind of adding some cosmetic operation, making a prettier house when the architect is called to put some color on the door, on the window. Actually, the design of the box, is, it's pretty much the same shitty box that, had, that we had in the periphery, just placed in such a way that we made a more efficient use of land, so that we could accommodate the 100 families, but still allow them to grow, because we knew if the families kept their jobs by staying in the place where they have been for the last 30 years, all that money could go directly into the housing units. So what, you ha what we have here is a house here that expands over here, a house here that expands over there, and then individual duplex apartments that this one expands over here, this one over here, this one over here, so on and so forth. So this process of expansion, because there were no structural operations, one of the five points that we identified was do the structure for the final middle class standard, so that then when families intervene, they do not perform any structural operation, just enclose the void. And because of that, the second half of the house, the first one cost $7,500 paying for sewage, land and house, the next 36 square meters, this, uh, both houses and apartments achieved 72 square meters, in average costed $1,500. So one-fifth of the cost of the initial, the many reasons, the size of the void, three meters, wood is, so, is sold in Chile in three meters, steel is sold in six meters, you cut it in half, there are not leftovers, uh, that kind of operation. But in order to pay things that were more difficult to do, there were things that we couldn't do, and this was part of the negotiations the families chose what not to do in order to pay more difficult stuff. So no pavements, no painting, no finishings, because that's something that they can do individually. But if instead of paying for, for more finishing, we pay for well-located land and they keep their jobs, then the process of finishing would begin rather quickly. In addition, it would have been impossible for us to design following their taste. I mean, we would have never guessed that this was the color that they wanted or the pavement that they wanted. This is something that you cannot tailor-made at that scale. 
The same thing with the duplex apartments on top. <laughs> so what we're trying to solve ultimately as an equation, this is this triad. Low rise density in order to pay for well located land and low so that we don't have to maintain <laughs> expensive you know, elevators, elevated corridors, there's enough evidence in the world that in this level nobody pays for the common good spaces. So low rise, high density, but without overcrowding, with the possibility of, of expansion. With this principle, we have done many different designs depending on the climatic conditions. You know, for you to have an idea, Chile, is, is, it goes from the northern part to the southern part, from Moscow, to Mumbai. So the, the geographic variety of the country requires different design approaches. This is a project, for example, we did in Mexico, uh, where there's roof in this case, uh, same principle, but different context. So now we're, we're also trying to develop different prefab approaches and not just building uh, and all these experiences has have been uh, collected in a book that was published in 2012 uh, by Hadji Kanz in, uh, in Germany. The last project we did was for the reconstruction of the city uh, after the earthquake and I'm going to show it afterwards but this is the last one we did and this leads me to the second case I wanted to talk about, which is the reconstruction after an earthquake. In 2010, Chile was hit by an 8.8 .8 Richter scale earthquake and tsunami. So, for you to have an idea, this was the kind... I'm going to show a video now. How it works. Seguimos conociendo noticias. Último día de descanso o último fin de semana para relajarse porque ya comienza marzo. ¿Y si quieres te cuento? ¿Te cuento? Huge social tension and a sense of insecurity to the collective fear of aftershocks and more waves. Elemental began to even windows. So. Yo trataba de agarrarme de alguna rama, de algún árbol, y no podía, porque la electricidad que iba al agua no me dejaba de agarrarme de nada. Y ahora estoy que firmando al niño también, no voy a hacer nada. Cuando salía a flote, lo afirmé mejor. Si no se me soltó solo, menos lo iba a soltar yo. But more than 100 persons were unable to do so and died. Many of them in the same island that helped to protect the city. Hay una imagen muy muy fuerte es la cara de papá mi capitán y él miraba hacia como el horizonte hacia el pastel hacia abajo esperando llegar su hijo. Yo me recuerdo que fuimos a buscar con mi ayudante una motosierra rápidamente al para la base tres que yo había divisado necesitábamos poder abrirnos paso en algún lugar. Y, y veía a Carlos Viejo esperando a su hijo, mirándolo, esperando que llegara a saber algo de él, porque su casa se había caído también. Entonces, como para decirle, Carlos, que llegó a nuestra casa, o qué está haciendo, él seguramente se lo imaginaba todavía esa altura trabajando con los bomberos, sabía que era capitán. Y pasó por el costado de él y... Era mi obligación como, como líder decirle eso. Su hijo falleció. No fue capaz. Ha recorrido todo el río. Y entré ahora mismo ni almorzado. Está buscando nada. ¿no? Es muy doloroso perder un hijo. El hijo es 
cagar. Hijo único. Lleva tres días la isla limpiándola. ¿Puedo encontrar algo? Nunca, nunca se... Hay que perder la esperanza, perder el... Encontrarlo, va a enterrarlo. Ya no puedo ni dormir ya. When people came down from the hills, they found... Well, I guess I don't have to explain you what does it mean to uh, lose uh, beloved uh, relatives. Uh, so I guess that part of the, the emotional charge to work uh, under pressure with no time <clears throat> is what uh, we were trying to overcome with the strategic design. So, we were called to work in a city in the southern part of the country and take charge and take care of the entire reconstruction of this city. Um, the, the tsunami, which was the mainly the new thing uh, in the country, um, hit the Pacific Ocean with 12 meter high waves and then it moved throughout the city along the river with 6 meter high waves. This is the demolition plan of the city, so around 80% of the city had to be demolished. Either was already destroyed and had to be demolished for structural reasons. So, when you are given the opportunity to think something from scratch, you would like to not miss that, that moment in case things need to be rethought radically. Normal circumstances do not allow such a process of revision. We also knew that the reconstruction was going to cost a lot of money, private money and public money, and we wanted to make sure that that money would be channeled in an efficient way. We were given 100 days to come up with the master plan and all possible designs for the reconstruction of the city. You know, every single thing from public buildings to infrastructure, public space, housing, uh, the energy matrix, uh, the economic recovery, everything in a hundred days. And because of the urgency and because of the scale of the operation, we thought that we had to conduct, again, a participatory design process in order to, not so much to ask the people what to do, but to identify what were the questions that they were expecting that we were given, we had to start from scratch. The, alternative, the first alternative, it was not clear. I mean, Chile resists very well earthquakes. I mean, we have had, in 1960, we had the, er the biggest earthquake ever recorded, 9.6. Uh, so, we do know what to do with earthquakes. We do not know, or we are not prepared for tsunamis. So, this was a new question in Chilean urban design. And some alternatives floating in the air. First one, forbid installation on ground zero, because too dangerous. If you have a disciplined population like the Japanese, Japan is uh, discussing exactly the same thing today, well, people may obey, but we know that in case of Chile, even if we pass a law, that piece of land will be occupied anyhow, illegally, in even worse conditions. So we thought that that was not only unrealistic, but irresponsible to do with public money. Alternative two, big wall to resist new tsunamis. And this was conveniently lobbied by big building companies because it meant big building contracts. It also meant no political complication, no land expropriation, which was one of the problems with the first alternative. But unfortunately, we learned from Japan that trying to resist the energy of nature is just nonsense. So again, this was not an alternative, and we thought we had to start a participatory design process to discuss uh, another alternative. Let me see if I can find where it is. So having started to work in Constitución, formal way, transform. Our proposal was to have... 
decir cómo se quiere la ciudad, ahora nota su posición y vaya a la casa del pez y el pez es su opción. Participa a toda la comunidad, así que todas las comunidades. Específicamente yo como pescador, tengo 25 pescadores, ¿dónde lo voy a llevarlo yo? ¿Al bosque? Entonces, ¿por qué nosotros no podemos tener una defensa de hormigón? Por supuesto, bien hecho. Soy estoy en la Constitución y vivo en mi sector. Y este señor me llega así, que yo no puedo seguir viviendo ahí. Ha vivido toda mi familia, toda mi vida ahí. Crié a mis hijos y mis hijos, crié a los hijos, y mis hijos, y mis nietos y todo. Pero ¿por qué me viene a imponer usted? ¿Para qué me está imponiendo? Mi zona de yo no puedo autorizar a construir. No, ¿Qué es lo está diciendo? We understood that for the people. So I guess that from the body language you get that participatory design is not a romantic kind of thing that, okay, let's all dream about the future of the city. And, and as I said before, participatory design is not in order to ask people what the answer to a given problem must be. It is mainly to try to identify what is the right question that needs to be answered. There's nothing worse than answering well the wrong question. So, as a consequence of this participatory design process, what people said was, okay, thank you that you're coming here to think about the future of the city and protect it against the tsunami, but you know, the next one is going to come in what, 20 years, 30 years? But every single year, we have the problem of the flooding due to the rain. Whatever you do, make sure that you're going to solve the flooding issue and not just the tsunami issue. In addition, our public space sucks. It's really bad. They didn't know, we measured that. It was 2.2 square meters per inhabitant. The OMS recommends 9 square meters per inhabitant. London has 44 square meters of public and green space per inhabitant. So, again, they said, make sure that if you're talking about a sustainable future city, that we improve the quality of our public space. Finally, there was the question of the identity or the heritage and the old buildings that fell. Make sure that we just not rebuild in whatever way. But people said, you know what, our identity is not so much connected to old architecture, we're not even close to have to what you have here. When in Chile you ask to a person, and what about that house? No, yeah, that house is really old. It must, must be over 90 years old. So we're not even close to what you have here as an air heritage, but nevertheless people said our identity is not connected to, to architecture, but to nature. The origin of the city is the river, but the access to the river is privately owned. We cannot access because it belongs to a group, a bunch of private families, the richest one in the city, actually. So, what we came up with was that instead of alternative one or two, particularly two, that would have been a disaster for the flooding due to the rain, blocking forever the access to the river, and actually that was the alternative that was about to be approved by the Congress, we had to demonstrate that the real question was a different one. And we said, look, instead of trying to resist the force of nature, dissipate it against geographical threats, provide geographical answers. In between the sea and the city, let's have a forest that is able to introduce friction and chaos in the waves to dissipate the energy by 40 to 50 percent and then allow that to, to perform with specific building codes in a more safer way. And actually, this was what we proposed, a park, a forest actually, that because of the waves eventually may come along the river, this is why the island in front of the city was able to dissipate and the waves here were six meters and not 12 meters like here, that along this new park, energy of potential tsunamis would be dissipated this would guarantee democratic access to the river. It would perform as a way to laminate the water due to the rain that comes from the hills in here and would increase up to seven square meters per person the public space and the public so standard of the city. So this is how it looks today. The park and the forest is under construction. You see over here. 
And in addition, several projects have been uh, in parallel being built again. And as I said before, this is the, the housing project that was maybe the first one that we finished. Again, the same idea. Half of a good house instead of a small one, so that the process of uh, achieving that middle class standard can begin to happen right away. And finally, the last project I would like to show for the need of synthesis is this, uh, the Innovation Center uh, at the Catholic University, Angelini Innovation Center, that a few weeks ago won the Design of the Year in, in London. This project here. It, it happened that in this uh, same campus of the Catholic University, the, this is the mathematics faculty, the first project uh, I ever did in 1998, then the CMS Towers here, and then the new Innovation Center, the, the, the subway on the main street is in the upper part of the slide, uh, was, that's the new site that was going to take place. So, <clears throat> what I would like to show here is the in between the lines of the project, I mean the cooking process. I'm, I'm going to open up the kitchen uh, of the process, of the project. And as you see here, it's in Spanish, but nevertheless it's called an internal agenda, an external agenda. And by internal agenda, what I want to show is what are the kind of things that we do not want to do anymore, and what are the kind of things that we would like to move into uh, this next phase. So, what is, here it says in, in regular, it means uh, going backwards, not anymore, the hand. By hand, I mean the design capacity as a kind of skill or talent, where you show how cool you are in doing, you know, forms. Uh, this not anymore, trying to avoid that. So actually, we were trying to go away from this. This is the mathematics faculty from 98, or the CMS Towers, or the, the project in Texas, or the house in Ordos. Uh, so all these things, not anymore. Uh, we were, and in those projects, we were trying. We were trying to go backwards to a more primitive state of being through construction. And uh, what we were trying to do instead, instead of being primitive in the way of building, was to be primitive in the way of making the form. Projects that could take care of, the, of themselves without maintenance. This is a project we completed in Mexico for a pilgrimage route, for example. That is, it's not even architecture, it's, it's kind of a piece of infrastructure. Or the project uh, that we started to do for Vitra in, uh, in Germany. That site that we were giving was a garage exactly behind Saha Hadid's fire station. Where we wanted to go for a very, very primitive uh, building system that as a consequence has primitive forms, read. or this winery in Germany, and maybe this is the first project where we were trying to do very stupid forms composed only by weight. We wanted weight and gravity to be the driver for design. So, as I said here, this was in our own work what we were trying to abandon and we, we were trying to give more opportunities to. But in the bottom line here, it also says who the kind of people uh, that we were looking at, that we were interested in, because we thought they were models to follow. And I, it says here, I don't know if you can read it in the back here, it says uh, Aires Mateus, Smilian Radic, uh, Paco Alonso, Rafael Iglesias, or artists like Erwin Bourne, Richard Serra, Richard Long, the choreographer, uh, Forsyth, or the Swiss architect Merkley. So, <clears throat> the question of weight, for example, in, in Erwin Born's work, where the, the pencil is, is holding this uh, unstable piece that finally finds a, a moment of, of, of calm. So forces that are put in play 
to stabilize to stabilize the components and each component being as stupid as possible. On the other hand, and, and this is um, again in Spanish, but what we what it says there, we were trying to avoid to be another thumbnail. I mean, when you go to the web pages today and scroll down. There's thousands of, of projects that you don't even know, and they look all the same, all flashy, all the same renderings, all the same stuff. Uh, and we didn't want to be another part of that thumbnail connection, uh, collection of, of, of forms trying to claim, look how cool I am. Uh, it also says that um, how not to add another, another frill, another unnecessary move, uh, how to eliminate architectural elements. How to eliminate graphism, uh, less glare, less glow, more opaque, solid, higher testosterone, low adrenaline. So, hopefully, none of this shit. None of that shit. None of that shit. And even though this is not that shitty, it's still architectural in the sense that it has the columns, the roof, the slab, the wall. I mean, it, it has all these kind of tiny little cute elements that they're not primitive enough somehow. If an earthquake enters this building, the entire building will disappear and what is going to remain are the bones and maybe those bones are something that makes sense. So we would like, we, we're like designing as if putting a, a ten Richter scale, Richter scale earthquake into the thing and see what is left so that it will be able to be as timeless as possible, as primitive and archaic as possible. So we were trying also to avoid all these things too architectural, not primitive enough. All these things and then this typical, you know, the bending, the folding and all these kind of verbs that we're up to here today with this kind of approach. Beyond form, what we were also, and, and all this just to remember you, what we're trying to do was to charge the question of what informs the form of a project. And first, for our architect to have heroes or to have seen other things, it, it is a quite important exercise. And we want it to be, I'm going to here, to be as sincere as possible to show what those influences are. But besides form, we were trying to avoid, for the weather, like the one of Santiago, operations that are beyond aesthetics. Like when you choose to do a glass tower, and this is actually the highest one in South America, by Cesar Pelli. I think it's embarrassing that because the, it is the biggest greenhouse effect fabricator in, in the entire South America, and yet, it gets qualified lead gold because it has bicycle parking on the sidewalk. This is really nonsense. And it gets lead gold because it uses the water of the close by river to cool down the system and geothermal mass and all that kind of sophisticated stuff to solve a problem that should have never existed in the first place if you're just not stupid. I mean, <laughs> sustainability is not rocket science, it's common sense. And if you follow that common sense, you solve, at least in a weather like the one of Santiago de Semi Desertic, you solve the issue instead of getting awarded deep gold for solving a problem that shouldn't have existed. This is what 99% of the office buildings look like in Santiago, so they do follow that approach. It is not only environmentally embarrassing because of the amount of energy needed to cool down, to air condition those buildings, but in addition to that, it is also a very bad place to work. I mean, the only floors that you see here that do not need to cover the transparency that may have been the initial, okay, I'm going to do a glass tower because I want a transparent relation to the environment. The first thing you do is to block down the thing because the amount of sun, the radiation and glare makes it impossible to work. I mean, the reflection on the computer screen and all that. So you end up blocking, as the first operation, the supposed transparency that you were looking for. The only floors that are not occupied are the ones that do not have curtains. 
inside, which is a disaster, is the most stupid thing to do against a greenhouse effect. So instead of that, we were looking at things like this, Peter Merkley, Paulo Mendes in Brazil, Seward Leverance, or Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn in uh, Ahmedabad, or also Louis Kahn in Dhaka. We were also looking at, at Soto de Moura. Uh, actually, this was the starting point for the project. As, as you see, these are the, the first sketches. And even though you're consciously trying to abandon a path, the first thing you do is to follow in that same path once again. I mean, again, forms, slices, you know, look, I'm cool, I'm going, I'm going to get published and all that kind of thing. So, no, at least we were on time to recognize before showing it to the client that this was not what we really wanted. I mean, we went into this. I don't know if you can see, it's not very good. But we started from the Soto de Moura project and instead of having the, these pieces being layered and accumulated by pure weight, we just, first, at least we made one vertical and then the other one vertical. And from there on, the compositional pro process started. I'm not going to go to the details of, of all the things, but in any case, um, the accumulation of floors, as you see, uh, we were accumulating one floor, three floors, three floors, and four floors. And actually, some of these uh, higher pieces on top that re are reduced while you go down intensifies that notion of gravity being the compositional principle of the building. It's compressed as soon as you go down. It's very hard to communicate this with pictures, uh, but if you go there, it's not the eyes, the way you perceive the building, it's the shoulders, you, it's the weight of the building, the way you understand the operation. So, this is the plan, in all the four corners are the shafts, so the biggest threat to an innovation center is obsolescence. And obsolescent not only in terms of language, we wanted to produce a kind of timeless building, but also in terms of function. I mean, an innovation center will be used by different companies with researchers, and eventually they will change their mind over time. New companies will come, and you need enough space to put a new chimney, new cables, new wires, new whatever. And this is why the five by five meter corners of the buildings are these uh, functional shafts. So, 
what we ultimately did was to turn the typical floor plan of an office building inside out. So instead of having a transparent perimeter with glass with an, a, and an opaque core with the elevators and shafts and all that, we put all the mass in the perimeter and then had a transparent core. Once you have the mass in the perimeter, you avoid direct sun radiation uh, on, on the glass. And by doing so, we went from 120 kilowatts per square meter per year, which is a typical energy consumption for air conditioning, a glass tower, to 40 uh, kilowatts per square meter per year. So 300% more efficient just by using common sense. If you allow them for cross-ventilation and can open the windows, the sustainability issue is solved. But in addition to this environmental operation, we wanted to multiply the meeting spaces of people throughout the entire height of the building. So that's why by, by grouping in three floors or four floors, we had this kind of elevated squares throughout the building so that people could meet. The same thing applied to the interior. I mean, I have an office in the 25th floor, for example, and I've been going up and down for years, and I have no idea what Smilian on the 20th floor, Smilian Radic has an office on the 20th floor, I go pass through his office and I never see what he's doing. But it could be that you go through what other people are doing, and in an innovation center, that exchange of information is crucial so what we did was to have a hollow, transparent core from where the, the light that is easier to treat comes and that also you can look what others are doing while circulating uh, vertically in the building. So I guess that the synthesis in this case was to try to avoid unnecessary operations and with one single move be environmentally efficient, try to embody as much as possible the life of the building, people meeting and exchanging knowledge, and finally looking for a language that instead of being contemporary, that was somehow what was expected from an innovation center, looked for timelessness. So replacing contemporariness by timelessness. And that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, no questions? Why not? <laughs> Hi, hello, and uh, thank you very much for the rich uh, lecture. Um, I would like actually to ask you about the uh, approach in uh, uh, about the approach. Uh, of different uh, kind of projects, like right? for example, the, two, uh, the first of two, you showed were kind of dealing with the uh, social problems, uh, and, and the last one was kind of um, where you can show maybe your architecture in, in some other way, uh, like form and uh, more maybe maybe more of the makeup stuff. So 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 the, the approach that uh, your office has in this different kind of well, I guess that what I mentioned as synthesis being the core of what, we're, what we consider being the most valuable thing of architecture, while dealing with context and environments and questions where there's the scarcity of means, is not a choice. There's no other way to do it. You better make sure that you're synthetic, otherwise you're not going to be able to enter social housing. You're going to bounce back somehow. The same thing for public projects. In, gen in general, Chile is a relatively poor country, so whenever you want to do public projects, which are the relevant ones, I mean, if you want to have an impact with public space, with infrastructure, transportation and housing, you know in advance that you are going to be dealing with scarcity of means. And this is the case for the majority of the world. I mean, 80% of the world has no resources to solve their inhabiting and then the built environment issues. So we enter those fields of scarcity 
understanding what are the constraints, understanding the different languages, but our contribution is through design. So that's why we work in projects like the, these other buildings, because we need our mus designer muscles to be, you know, fit to enter this kind of public impact and social relevance project, uh, make really a contribution and not just, you know, the intention, but that you're not able to deliver. Our contribution is through design. One very specific example. In the social housing project I showed, the design key was, and if I could put a title, is that a square is more efficient to overcome poverty than a rectangle. Square, rectangle, this is the designer thing. Normally when you have a city and a, a grid and plots, they're rectangular and they have the narrow front towards the street and the, lo the longer part towards the back. This reason is because it's more efficient to serve more properties with less street, sewage, electricity, whatever. So the notion of efficiency is associated to the, to the rectangle. In that particular case, because of the irregularity of the site that was on the center of a block, it was more efficient to use something that in principle is less efficient, a square. And the reason is that while having so many corners, we needed a figure that was able to rotate many more times than in a conventional lot. So the lot of each house with an apartment on top being square allowed us to put 100 families instead of 70 that we could accommodate it by using rectangles that had problems with rotation. Whenever you reach a corner, there was a problem. And because we had 100 families, we had more subsidies, because we have more subsidies, we're able to pay for the land, and because people stay there and not expelled to the periphery, now their properties, the cost of the, the value of those properties today is between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars from the seven thousand dollars that were at the beginning. So we enter a social housing issue. But our contribution is to design. No other profession was able to accommodate the families, but architecture who knows how to deal with form. The other way around, when entering projects that do have bigger budget, it's not that we had a lot of money for the uh, innovation center, but comparing to the social housing, we had a lot more money. The risk there is that having more money, you begin to spend it to just show off how skilled you are, try to be trendy or try to be, you know, uh, publishable in the coolest magazines and that kind of thing. And the discipline you learn from social housing and from public projects allows you to fight yourself, not to be arbitrary. So again, the constraints from the public world is used in design to have a more disciplined form. It is still a strong form. It's not a shy building, it's a kind of, um, it's a strong building, but it's, it's a kind of hard to swallow building, it's not an obvious building, but nevertheless, nothing is there that is not the case. Every single kilogram of cement that is in that building can be defended. And this is the, the kind of negotiation that we do between design being the way we contribute to social housing or social issues, and constraints being what uh, works as a filter against the superfluous. Okay. Thank you. And um, you mentioned also that uh, for the last project that uh, uh, something about the monument, uh, the mon uh, that you were kind of, um, uh, how should I formulate that? Uh, the, 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 difference, uh, the difference of this contemporary architecture and uh, the um, architecture that would emerge maybe from the from the some sort of monument. Uh, what 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 is that? I I I was very very impressed by looking at Louis Kahn for the first time uh, in India and Bangladesh. Uh, it was a very very. You know those moments where you look at the building and your reaction is like, wow, this is... 
and simultaneously it's like, fuck, I mean this, I'm not going to ever, ever get there. So it's a mixture of admiration and envy. Uh, and what Kant's architecture had was that thing, those buildings could have, uh, could have had 2,000 years. I mean, it, it could have been built 2,000 years ago, or they could have been built in the next 100 years. I mean, that, particularly the, the DACA building, the parliament, it's a kind of, it's an, an UFO landing uh, from the future, or people relate to it as, as being the natural monument that that culture didn't have, I mean, from centuries ago. I guess that this is, this timelessness uh, of certain architecture, is architecture is something that we're interested in. I mean, in the end, when you do, when you do something, even if you don't want to, it's going to last a couple of centuries. So better make sure that it stands the test of time, that it resists that interrogation over time, and that you're not um, too trendy. I mean, I guess when you look at your own pictures from the 80s, you know, awful haircut and the clothes, and then you feel embarrassed about yourself. Well, it's a photograph and it's clothes. I mean, the, but when you leave that kind of embarrassing moment in the city for centuries to come, well, may better make sure that you are not making such a mistake. And uh, so this, this kind of movement towards the origin uh, is something that we're interested in and interested. And mainly, I would say, and this is the most difficult part, because I really how can I? I mean, architecture is guided, or design more than architecture, by unspeakable certainties. You know, you, you are in the office and put something over there, and then of a sudden, you <laughs> over here. <coughs> no, no, there. Then somebody enters the room and says, Are you sure? Why not here? <laughs> no, right there. Why? I don't know. I, I mean, I can't explain it. But I know it. So it's an unspeakable certainty. Most of the things that you know hit you somehow that that penetrate, I would say, in the human condition, are these moments of unspeakable certainty. A landscape, uh, some buildings, uh, some events. The the architecture somehow is not is not required, it's not a must, but the best moments is when it's able to dig deeper in the mystery of human condition. And I would say there are certain moments, certain buildings that by getting rid of the trendiness, of the moment, of the... and go to that archaic primitive truth are more able to connect with these mysteries of the human condition. I can prove it, uh, I can't demonstrate it, you can perfectly think, but yeah, but this is it, it's bullshit anyhow. I mean, well, uh, but at least us, is, that's what we're looking for. I can't explain it, that's why I'm not teaching, I'm not going to write a book about this thing, I'm just going to do the thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop here because <laughs> there are actually more questions. <laughs> I think maybe it's up to you. I, I flew a long way. I'm here. If you want to, okay, I, I can okay. stay. I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> okay, no, I'm going to hit him. <laughs> uh, okay, then um, um, we had we had Hrvoje um, Nirich uh, two days ago. And he was also. Um, very happy to have a chance to go abroad and to do teaching in other places because that was also uh, some sort of an influence and uh, very positive for him. Uh, how do you find it uh, working in uh, other places, like for example in Switzerland? Uh, you were also showing from Peter Mack with uh, Conjunta, uh, which actually has some connection to the stuff of the monumental. Yes. Uh, you, you asking about teaching or working abroad? Uh, working. Working. Um, if, if we are able not to work abroad, I would prefer not to. 
the more we can work in our own environment, the better. Uh, there's, I mean, the project I show in, in Moscow, uh, I was presenting December 8th in the shortlist to the group of, of juries and the client and the minister of whatever, uh, 25 degrees minus uh, in Celsius, a language that I didn't understand, uh, the in between the cultural in between the lines, you can smell corruption in the air, and I said that. What am I doing here? I mean, why do I have to spend energy, emotional energy, in trying to understand something that even if we win, well, I, I don't know if it's the best thing to do. Whereas, in your own place, the, those intangible things, those values that are in between the lines, that cultural kind of, uh, of values, at least, that they, and I'm particularly worried about the emotional energy that it takes. I mean, to come up with an idea, it's hard. And there's people that may have a lot of ideas. Uh, I don't. I mean, you have a good idea every now and then. Uh, so I would like to make sure that the amount of and the effort that it takes to come up with an idea goes all the way and gets built. And that has lower chances if you go to other places. Of course, there are moments where either it's an important project and it makes make, make sense. Uh, if you build something that is uh, for a good client, then it also helps your practice. I mean, it's not that projects are raining and you're struggling to get a project and all that. And if you get a good project somewhere else published, then you, it makes your life easier. But if I could avoid being abroad, uh, that's what we actually after the earthquake there was a great moment for us because there was so much work to do in Chile that we finally were hired in Chile nobody was hiring us uh, but then finally after the earthquake we were able to turn a little bit so now we have two three projects abroad not not more than that if, if possible I would like to do so you never know I mean it's um, if you are offered an important project outside but the thing is that you were at least us I want to take care, pay attention to that project. It requires time. Uh, if I can, you know, think of a, okay, I have to solve the stair. Uh, what a great thing to think again about the stair, again and again. But instead, if you're having too many things, and oh, I have to solve the stair. I mean, if it becomes a pain in the ass, well, I prefer, it's something wrong with the thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think my question is more of a, it's more on a personal level. You, what I've gotten throughout this whole lecture was that uh, you, you're kind of against, not kind of, actually quite against uh, contemporary architecture and you lean more towards the timeless type of architecture and I would like to know if, um, have you always, uh, like from the beginning of your career, have you always been headed in this direction? I mean, uh, towards this type of architecture, or was there something personal that had happened in which uh, allowed you to uh, focus more on efficiency rather than something uh, beautiful or uh, in the aesthetic um, means? Um, no, it was not always like that. I guess that, um, I mean, you study architecture for five years, in our case, seven years. Uh, so, as soon as you go out into the professional life, you want to prove that you learned a lot. So, even if you are asked to do a tiny thing, you come up with a lot of fireworks and stuff and the curve, and even if it's not needed because you just want to... You had so much forms accumulated in your hands that as soon as you get the opportunity, you want to throw them out too. So, that happened to me too. That I was lucky enough, not knew, didn't know, know at the time, uh, that all the first projects were like restaurants, uh, shop, uh, a discotheque, that kind of thing. So, for the for the good of the humanity, these things disappear. You know, they don't last. Uh, so I was able to kind of test these things and take out that need to prove, even or yourself or others, that you're capable of designing with stuff that was 
dissolved in time. Still, when, I, when the first produce I did, because of the constraints of working in a country like Chile, even if you want to, you're not given enough resources, permissions. You have to justify a lot, every single thing that you do, which is fantastic. To have constraints, to have pressure, not budget, and all that, it's a great, great filter against arbitrariness. So I was lucky enough to have started working in Chile for the first projects that will be there, I don't know for how long, but they will last. But to tell the truth, and I would like to maybe be precise, it's not that we're leaving the beauty and entering the functionalism. What we're trying to leave out is the arbitrariness, arbitrariness and penetrate in this more, in this kind of the mystery of the human condition, what I, I, I said with the unspeakable certainties. Those, it's, it's hard to tell, I mean, you either recognize or not, you may agree or not, but at least, honestly, you, at least, you recognize when this is right, when this is not right. And this not happened to me with my own work. It happened in the work of others. I remember going to Argentina, when was it? 2002 or three or something like that. And I met, it was mentioned there, this our architect, Rafael Iglesias. So there I go, I arrived to one of his projects, and when I saw the project, it was like a hit in the face, not a slap, a hit, a hard hit in the face. And it was like, I felt embarrassed of what we were doing. I actually called the office and I said, look, stop, stop what we're doing. And, you know, we have to start from scratch. We, and I sent some pictures. Uh, is it? This is the kind of thing that we should pursue in, in Latin America or in Chile in context where our luxury is not in making the high-tech thing or the flashy thing. I mean, our luxury is that we can be primitive. When I arrived to the US for that project, uh, the first, the project I did before was the CMS Towers. And the CMS Towers have a landing of wood that is very rough, extremely rough, because there was no money for doing other things that, you know, big pieces of, of wood taken from demolition. Which gives a kind of a, a landing of the thing that it looks as a, I don't know, it could be, it could be megalithic, you know, really old times. If I want to do that, as, as uh, Jamie was saying, that project in the US, I would, was going to be sued. If somebody stumbles, it's the building's fault. No, not your fault to pay more attention. It's the building's fault and then you're screwed because you're sued by lawyers. So the entire design in the first world is guided by the fear of lawyers, by the fear of being sued. And in countries like ours, it's a luxury to be able to enter a place that is as that simple. I mean, it can't get more simple than that, and this is a luxury. But in any case, I guess that it started with looking at Rafael Iglesias' work, but then I, I, I entered the Pritzker Prize jury in 2009. And as part of the duties of the jury, uh, you're visiting architectures of not only potential candidates, but of, of buildings to remind yourself as a juror what is the level that architecture has been able to achieve over time? And when you look at that stuff, it, again, I mean, the effort, the amount of energy that it takes a bad project is equal to the effort that it takes to try at least to do a good project. Even a bad project requires a lot of drawing, a lot of approval, a lot of meetings, a lot of convincing. So why not spend that energy in trying to do at least something that is not mediocre? And in that sense, I guess that when you are reminded all the time, and this was the beauty and the, the hell of being in the jury, because you are exposed to high quality architecture, and at the same time, you feel like you are nothing. I mean, compared to that, you are reminded constantly how far away you are from what architecture has been able to be. So I guess that out of respect, to what the body of architecture has been able to be, we have been trying as consistently as possible. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can't do that, and it's, uh, it's life, but at least as, a, as an attitude, 
is to try to go for that kind of architecture that we admire and envy at the same time. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to ask you something about uh, your interaction with authorities, with uh, people that are involved, beneficiaries, authorities, designer, how difficult it is for uh, this kind of approach to deal with the mediocrity or the, um, the way we usually design buildings. Very hard. Um, um, I would say that the, the only the, there's, we're not experts in anything, but the only thing that we try to do is to be as horizontal as possible. And I'm going to explain that I think it's a different thing to talk to power than to talk to communities. Um, when dealing with a community, and in the case of Chile, you're dealing in rooms like this with families, and in the room there's dogs, babies, kids running. So if you're trying to make a point that is too intellectual, forget about it. You know, kids are crying. So and you better make sure that you are able to prove your point in a simple enough way so that families can either agree or reject to what, to what you're saying. Well, the only thing that we're trying to make sure First of all, is to provide information and inform about the constraints. So before asking anything, let's understand what is the problem here and what are the constraints. If somebody knows how to deal with constraints, it's a family that has to live on one dollar a day or two dollars a day. I mean, if, if there's an expert in how to squeeze the best out of scarce resources, are families themselves. So instead of coming to to promise things that you will not be able to deliver, you try to extract from them strategies to deal from scarcity because they're good at that. That's why the process of establishing priorities. Look, we're not going to be able to do everything, but what is the top of the list for you? In, un in understanding that top of the list, and this is where the question of horizontality comes, there are some things that they may say, voting. I mean, we all want a uh, whatever, neon light on the facade. Sorry, we're not doing that. I mean, I can't care less if you have 100% of hands up of something that I consider not to be professionally responsible to do. But if there are things that make sense, we follow that. That horizontality in the treatment of not thinking that on the other side of the table there's a poor guy that doesn't know how to write and read, doesn't exist. If that person has something to say to me and it makes sense, I have no problems in changing it, but the same way I have no guilt of having had the privilege of studying in the university, knowing things that they don't know, and explain to them that, look, this is better than this other thing. And, and normally this doesn't exist. When there's a top-down uh, attitude, you feel guilty. And if people choose something that even yourself don't believe in, you kind of say, well, yeah, but how can I say no? Well, you can't say no. It's, it's abs and that honesty and horizontality of the treatment is crucial so that it creates confidence. It, they trust you and then you have to, when you have to go to difficult moments to navigate through the system, that trust is very important. We're not friends of the people, you know, I, I don't come there to, to be, uh, what, how can I say, we're not particularly good people. I mean, I'm just a normal person. And this pro these problems, these kind of questions, require professional quality, not professional charity. I don't work pro bono. I mean, I want to get paid for what I do. And I'm go hopefully going to pay it well, because if anything, social housing is a difficult question. If I go to the doctor to have brain surgery, I mean, if the guy makes a mistake, I may remain blind, you know, without walking. So I want to make sure if it's a difficult task, I would like to have the best possible professional. In social housing, it's like that. When you make a mistake, you multiply it by thousands of units. In, in, as, as soon as you make a mistake, it becomes a, a massive issue. So you have to make sure that you have a better possible professionals throughout the entire chain. Architects, engineers, builders, social workers, politicians, and all that. 
So that regarding the communities, regarding power, I would say that we've always entered power with just single requests, which is intellectual independence and professional freedom. If whatever I suggest is against your interest, I will have to do that. I just want to be given that freedom because if analyzing the information, what needs to be done, it's against your political agenda or your, budget, your profit. On the long term, we know this is going to be better. Sometimes they trust you, sometimes they don't. Normally what works better, again, is not that because they're particularly good people, but because they're in deep shit. I mean, they are under pressure, or they have a riot, or they have a, a, a catastrophe or something. So there's no other choice to do that. And architecture, in that sense, is able to deliver quickly alternatives. The typical consult, consult, consultant approach is endless diagnosis. Well, how do we rebuild the city? Mm, tough. Like we have to study this thing. This not about no. We have to study this thing. If you're a typical consultant, and Italo Calvino said that an expert is somebody that in a given field can tell you what not to do, these problems require to take the risk of making a proposal and to say what to do. And architecture, in its very core, is able to organize information in a proposal key. As soon as you organize all that is floating in the air in a proposal key, all the energies of the politicians, the families, the economic forces, the, everything goes into one direction. You may be wrong, you adjust it, but you're making a proposal. You're not wasting time in talking about the problem. You are identifying the question and then immediately, as soon as possible, make a proposal. And I guess that at least power is comfortable with that because they want to have outcomes as soon as possible. Political timing, it, it's very short. So I guess that if you have a pressure and you make a proposal right away, I guess that you get the permission to be able to navigate through the system. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So you mentioned before that uh, sometimes you get to see a building and then you just get a bomb with it and you are like actually feel so angry about it and small about it. So my question is a little bit personal. Uh, in what time of your life you actually uh, recovered yourself from that? So basically, when did you stop being angry and started being someone people angry now? Because after this lecture I kind of really envy you buildings. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... Thank you. I think you're, ne you, you, you're never there. Um, it, it may happen less and less, uh, particularly with contemporary architecture. Um, it, and sometimes this happens with non-architecture. I mean, there are moments where you have this, I call it this F moments, you know? You go to this, fuck, you know? And, and this may happen sometimes in the most simple situations. I mean, I guess that the Corbusier had this picture in the Petite Maison where he has a bench in front of a wall uh, and, and one can guess, it's not seen in the picture, that that is for looking at the lake that is in front. The wall is, is having sun, so it may be a little bit warm. So there you're sitting with your back in the warm, with a warm back, looking at the lake. I mean, it can't get more perfect than that. And this is a rather simple thing. This, it's almost not designed. Uh, so this moment keeps on coming and you're surprised sometimes. You just have to be open uh, to look at these situations and say more than design. It's situations that are... And then as soon as the, you, you are hit by that, then you try to understand what are the design conditions that allow that to happen. Is the orientation, is the length of the building, the height of the bench, the, the material of the wall, the finishing of the wall. I mean, and as soon as you get hit by that, the only difference with a, a typical user, that because everybody can enjoy that, is that you have the problem of the blank page. I need to translate that into a lesson so that the next time I'm in front of the blank page, I do know what tools 
to use to try to produce that too. But I guess that, that uh, it never ends. You're, you're constantly surprised. I, the, the envious part is, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing. And um, you're humbled by that. I, I think that the most important thing is that you're reminded constantly uh, that your contributions are, are, are rather small. And, um, and that humbling part, it's also a good fuel so that you need a lot of energy to be able to not fall into the business as usual thing. And I guess it, uh, feeling bad about, about not being able to produce quality, I guess, is a, is a good driver. Uh, so it's a combination of, of uh, to avoid something bad, but also to try to grasp something that can be a, a gain, you know, a common good. Uh, other questions? Uh, in the beginning, you referred to housing as investment, if I'm not yes. wrong. Well, uh, this kind of if, uh, investment thinking for housing sometimes is making uh, people buy more. And by buying more, we leave the other people without a shelter, because I prefer <laughs> referring to a shelter. Uh, this leads sometimes to when investing we invest more and more and becoming more private without thinking about uh, power people as you said and in some ta uh, in some cases when social housing is happening uh, they give a lot of investments from that for them and the, uh, the price of them is being high so what it, uh, why do you refer it as an investment for the housing? Okay, so uh, here I may need a little bit of context on what I mentioned about policy. 60% of what's being built in Chile uses some kind of subsidy. So actually, these people is not buying a house. It's getting a subsidy from the state to be able to have access to a housing unit. Being a property-oriented policy, when you receive that subsidy, you become the owner of the, that house. But you receive that subsidy only once in your lifetime. So it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance to take that money and make it become your family asset. If that unit is designed in such a way that it gains value over time, you're going to inherit that to your children as something that is valuable, instead of something that worth nothing. It won't people make to buy more because they're not buying. They're receiving a subsidy. I just uh, want to show you an example uh, of social housing that happened in Turkey. Uh, they had this problem of slum uh, housing okay. and they, uh, they created a community of uh, social housing and they became uh, an uh, investment uh, purpose of uh, constructing. So people were buying more and more. That's why I wanted to ask if uh, why did you refer as who, investment? Who was buying more and more? Uh, everyone, because they were cheap houses, but they, they they knew that they were making an investment. So uh, I wanted to ask you why do we refer to a shelter? Because I think the main purpose should be as a shelter, not as an investment. Because shelter is emergency housing. I mean, to protect yourself to the environment, you, can, you do that with the emergency housing. Social housing is a different thing. You would like that to become a tool to overcome poverty and not just a way not to die the next winter because of the bad living conditions that you are in a slum. If you want to use it as a tool, an economic tool, to overcome poverty, and you are the owner of that house, what can actually happen, the, the, the policy in Chile is like this. $7,500, direct subsidy is $7,200, family savings $300. So the family, in order to have access to that benefit, has to save $300. It takes them years to save 
$300. So if you're not getting the subsidy, they have no capacity whatsoever to access any other benefit from the state that if not using a subsidy. Once they receive the subsidy, they go out of the list and do not get, again, such a benefit. You have a prohibition to sell your house for five years. After five years, if you want to, you can sell the property, but you're not going to get a subsidy again. So, if you have a property that gains value over time, and actually the, the profit has been between 300 and 400 percent in what we have designed. If a family, by having saved $300 and then takes that thing and sells it for $20,000, I think it's fantastic. Do that. But they don't do it because they know that for $20,000 they're never, ever going to get an alternative that is in the center of the city, they're not going to benefit from the schools, from the transportation, from the health, and from nothing of that. So even if they can, no, none of the families has sold this project because of the access of opportunities that they provide, and they want their children to benefit from those opportunities that cities concentrate. So I guess that the answer is, if we're living in a capitalist world, well, at least let, let's make capitalism work for everybody and not just for the few that are on the top of the pyramid. Thank you. I had a, a very short question. Uh, in all of the designs and the projects, they, there's criteria that are, uh, I mean, all the designs are evaluated. In your case, you think, uh, is it the innovation? Is it the, the design? Is it the budget you selected? Or uh, is it the solution that you've chosen for, for your cases? Or maybe is it all four of them at the same time? What do you mean by evaluated? What do you mean by the signs are evaluated? No, I mean, in, in general, when you when you do a project, you, you, you I mean, even for an award or even for a, a, a getting the, the work done, people, or, or the jury uh, evaluates oh. on the innovation and everything. And in this case, on your project, when you competed for your designs, what was the uh, what? What do you think was the the key that made you win those projects? Or, or you're talking in general, or, yeah, or in, in general? In, in, in social housing, basically. Um, to, tell, uh, to tell the truth, I have no idea. Um, no, the only thing that I know is that we have never, ever entered a, a word, submitting our work. I mean, the, the world divides in two. The awards that you submit your own project, and normally you have to pay a fee to enter that thing, like the World Architecture Festival that charges you 500 pounds to submit. And then if you're selected, you will have to pay your own ticket to go to present it in, I don't know, Singapore, I don't know where it is. So those kind of projects, with our, oh, the end aim is to promote yourself, they are normally bullshit. Then there are other projects where you don't even, you're not, you don't even present or submit your stuff. Somebody, a scientific committee uh, or whatever, eventually are looking at, at different things, social values, sustainability, uh, innovation, what, depending on the, on the kind of award that they're giving. And then eventually you receive that, look, you've been recommended for this and that award, uh, would you submit your, your stuff to, to be able to have, uh, to, to have a chance to get awarded? These things we do, we do accept. And the reason is that I guess that good architecture is composed by your own capacity to, to be careful, to be creative, to be resistant, so that for, when for two years you have to go to the construction site and fight with the builder that wants to make the shortcut and you want to keep your, your design as it was because it makes sense, whatever. So it takes a lot of things. But one of the most important things that it requires is a good client. So, for example, in the Innovation Center, the Angelini Innovation Center, 
This was as a, a request for qualifications at the beginning. We submitted that, were chosen, a shortlist of eight. Out of the shortlist of eight, you were required to submit in more detail your staff, shortlist of four, uh, and then finally two projects. And we were asked, okay, if you are going to win, if, if you win this, this project, how would you do it? How would you approach the thing? That was January uh, 2011, maybe. Six months later, without being paid, we were still being asked, okay, but when you say that this project is uh, 1,000 euros per square meters, is with tax or without tax? I mean, you're not even in a concept that you're asked to work for free for all this time. There was a reason that we didn't know at the time, but we knew afterwards. We had lost to the other guy. The other guy presented a glass tower. So, innovation center equal contemporary equal glass, shiny, you know? So that's why with the committee that was looking for these projects, we had already lost. But there was the guy giving the money that was somehow, you know, it, this is fishy. I, for some reason that I don't know, I, I don't like that one. Even though this other thing, it's hard to swallow, there's something in this thing that I, I, I don't know what it is. So let's keep on asking. He didn't want to be rude and say, look, I'm putting the money, I'm choosing the thing. He was donating the money to the university. So his way, none of this we knew at the time, was like, ask, ask more questions, ask for more information. Let's, let's, let's bring more, more hairs to this soup. So that we've, after six months, one of the members of this board, of the, I was actually a lawyer, quite, quite, quite powerful lawyer, extremely conservative, so that we had no chance, aesthetically speaking, to win. He said, but you know what? This other guy's project is just a building. So when somebody is able to say that uh, another is just a building, it meant that we, we touched some fiber. And that meant that for that guy, putting the money that belongs to the club of the country, you know, the group of whatever, 10 guys, that the only thing that they want is to show that they're better than the other guy here, and they're more powerful, more whatever, you know. He took a chance to, to choose something that was against all the rest of the club, all his friends were building glass towers and for some reasons he decided to go in a different direction. It was a risk, and, and not a financial risk, a risk that while going to the club to play golf, he was laughed at and said, look at what this guy is doing, I mean, this, uh, he's lost his mind. But when he, he in, because ultimately it's the Angelini Innovation Center, we won the award in London, he was able to say, see, this is the thing. You know, I was looking something, I was able to look at something that you were not able to. And for us, it was extremely important that the club got the message that if you, you are in a war against the cliché, if you do not go for the common place, but for the common sense, then this might be appreciated somewhere. For us, that award it means zero, Euros. I mean, there's no money involved, but being awarded in London, beating Frank Gehry in the Louis Vuitton uh, building in Paris, beating Jean Nouvel, beating Herzog de Meron, it was a big thing so that this guy, the next time, is going to take the risk to go for something that is against the cliché. And eventually, his friends are going to do the same thing. So, this is the value of the awards for us, that they send messages, not just to the architectural community, who are not hired by either architects, to the clients, to the politicians, that taking some risks makes sense and may pay over time. Uh, no, more, no more questions. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for that.